Hello, everybody. This is Alex Severino here, and I'm going to be presenting with Ryan Callahan and Logan Hilgenbrink. And we're going to be talking to you guys about American International Group, also known as AIG. I'm going to give you guys an introduction of the case, and then Logan's going to get into some of the details. And then Ryan will discuss the auditing aspect, and Logan will wrap it up for us. So to get us started, who were they? AIG uh, is or was and still is one of the world's largest insurance and financial services companies. Um, they offer life insurance, property casualty insurance, retirement products, and they operate in more than 80 countries. They were founded in 1919 by Cornelius Vanderstar, and it was originally called American Asiatic Underwriters. So it originated in China, in Shanghai, but it is now headquartered in New York City. And then it became a publicly traded company in 1984. And the CEO at the time of the case we will be discussing was Maurice, also known as Hank Greenberg. So now I'm going to discuss some of the players in this case. The key um, player in this case was Maurice Hank Greenberg, and he was the former chairman and CEO of AIG. And then there was also Howard Smith, who was the former CFO of AIG. And I think it's important to mention that he previously worked for PwC for 19 years. And PwC was actually the auditor for AIG at the time. And then Elliot Spitzer was the former New York Attorney General who was the one who wanted to start investigating AIG. And then Ron Ferguson was the CEO of General Reinsurance Company, and this is one of the companies that um, AIG was colluding with and did some fraudulent transactions with. And then Elizabeth Monrad was a CPA and was the former CFO of Genry. There were also other players, and these were just the PwC auditors and then other executives from AIG and Genry. So now I'm going to discuss the actual fraud case. So it began in 2000 and was discovered in 2005. Um, investigations by the New York Attorney General and the insurance superintendent um, are they sued in May 26, 2005. And then February 9th in 2006, the SEC followed after them and filed and settled their charges against the AIG. Um, in the fall of 2004, this is whenever the Attorney General's Office and the Insurance Department began investigating. And this investigation occurred because there were rumors that AIG was assisting clients in manipulating their statements and they were bid rigging. So basically what this bid rigging was, was that they were colluding with insurance brokers and they were basically making the market appear more competitive than it actually was so that they could charge their clients more. And this investigation led to further discoveries about AIG. So basically there were two big sham transfers between AIG with General Reinsurance Company and Capco. With General Reinsurance, there was a $500 million um, transaction in which AIG actually was able to increase their loss reserves between 2001 or between 2000 and 2001 and they actually recorded a liability as a revenue in order to make their books look better. 
And then this transaction with Capco was a $200 million uh, transaction. And there was um, underwriting costs that they recorded as investment or capital losses in order to make their books look better as well. So in the investigations, the SEC found a trend of material misstated transactions and fraudulent behavior by the AIG. So I, the CEOs played huge roles in this case, and that was Greenberg and Ferguson of Genry. They um, colluded and agreed to uh, engage in these fraudulent activities. Um, 12 years later, Hank Greenberg actually admitted that he initiated, approved, and participated in these transactions. This was all done in order to mislead investors and analysts. Uh, this was basically done because analysts had been previously criticizing the amount of lost reserves that AIG had on hand. Um, all in all, this fraud allowed AIG to increase their financial results. Whenever their, or whenever their um, financial statements were restated, it, from the fr the prior years of fraud, it actually resulted in a 2.26 billion decrease in shareholders' equity, which was a 2.7 percent decrease. Now Logan's going to talk about the abuse of power. All right, first off, on the abuse of power, if you want to move forward with that, Ryan, for me. All right, uh, so you got Greenberg and Ferguson. Uh, they were the only two to orchestrate the deal between Jim Rhee and AIG. No others were involved in actually making the deal. Um, it shows, actually, that Jim Rhee's balance sheet showed a false increase in lost reserves, while income statement would show a increase in income for fourth quarter and for the first quarter of 2001. Um, another problem that I like to point out was Howard Smith's history with the PwC as he previously worked there for 19 years, which could have influenced the auditor's opinion. AIG would go on to admit a broad range of improper accounting that could la slash its net worth by 1.77 billion in accordance with this deal. Uh, Who would it benefit and how? Um, for right now, the ones that I really made out and saw was uh, both Greenberg and Smith would go on to receive bonuses of $9.9 .9 from the years of 2001 to 2004. Uh, both also will benefit from the stock price going up since they cooked the books. And then Jin Rhee, on the other hand, just had to make it look like they were on the hook for about $500 million in premium without actually paying it this in hand would net them a five million dollar fee for doing the deal without attracting the attention of regulators penalties um first off for penalties we have ron ferguson he was of one count conspiracy seven counts security fraud false statements to sec five counts and three counts of mail fraud uh, he would be sentenced to two years in prison, two years supervised release, and a $200,000 fine. Elizabeth Moran, the CPA, uh, she would have one count conspiracy, seven counts securities fraud, five counts false statements, and three mail frauds. She was going to be sentenced to 18 months in prison, three years supervised release, and 255 $250,000 fine. In 2009, Greenberg sold U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission charges over AIG's accounting, with Greenberg paying 15 mil and Smith paying 1.5 million. Now, as for the state of New York, after over decades of delays, deflections, and denials by Greenberg and Smith, 
Smith would go on to pay a $900,000 fee to the state of New York. And Hank Greenberg would go on to pay a $9 million fee to the state of New York. And now we've got, where are they now? So uh, Hank Greenberg, CEO and chairman of AIG, is now going to be at, uh, he's going to be the CEO and chairman of CB Star and Co. Inc. Star insurance companies and the star foundation he just recently received a lifetime leadership award from st john's university peter j tobin college business and then we have howard smith the cfo of aig is the director and vice chairman of finance cv star and co so they still work together now ryan will give you the audio perspective Thank you for that, Logan. Um, first thing we kind of got going up on is our uh, auditing standards, which were found in Section 316.85. Um, they list out the types of frauds that we have uh, divulged that happened during this case. The first was fraudulent financial reporting, which was the um, illegal transactions to decrease the loss reserves. And then the second one was the management override of the internal controls. Um, important to note here, this was all pre-Sarbanes-Oxley, so these, these transactions happened in 2001, which means that uh, integrated audits were not, they did not exist at this time, so they were just testing, um, they weren't testing for internal controls, which made this um, a little more difficult for auditors to pick up on because management used, abused its power and was overriding the transactions that were originally used. Um, so we're going to be identifying some of the fraud risk factors. The first we'll go over is the incentives that uh, Greenberg <clears throat> was trying to gain from this, the opportunities, we'll list those out. And then finally, we'll talk about the attitudes and rationalizations of the company and why we think they did it. Um, so our first fraud risk factor here is our incentives. We think the main one was to limit risk as uh, Alex previously stated. Uh, investors were really hounding them about how much reserves they had on hand so they wanted to um, create a little happiness with the, with the investors and to limit their risk on these loss reserves. Um, the second one, and as I previously kind of said too, was just to meet the investor expectations um on that the opportunities within aig there's a couple one they're the largest player in the market at the time they're the largest insurance company here in the united states and possibly the world um aig's size made these adjustments seem extremely small which kind of helped hint with the auditors of saying maybe these aren't material amounts enough they aren't material enough for them to issue another opinion on it management override was dominated by the two individuals at the top um, lack of board oversight was another key factor with this and then ineffective internal auditing uh, the internal auditors were ineffective at finding what uh, the two ceos were up to Um, their attitude and rationalization, their interest was making the company's loss reserves look healthier. Um, I want to explain the loss reserves a little bit. This is basically money that was set aside to pay policyholders who were filed or expected to file claims on their policies. So through this, they were decreasing their liabilities on their books and increasing the other aspects of their balance sheet. So they weren't setting cash aside to pay these policyholders their their claims when they act when they actually went through um, as i said they decreased their future liabilities with having to pay these claims um, a couple red flags that were drawn upon during all this um, the first one was aig created questionable questionable past transactions this has to deal with those loss reserves that they decreased on their balance sheet paperwork that was later found faulty from the Gen Re deal was not assessed properly, and this was by both the internal auditors and the external auditors of PwC. 
AIG Audit Committee, they also uh, they disclosed that they couldn't determine management had maintained appropriate reporting principles, but no, but this was really looked past when the auditors were in that were uh, doing their audit back then. Um, another key slide here, this is kind of the adjustments that were made back in 2000 and 2001. The big one obviously is 2000. If you want to take a closer look at this, you can go ahead and pause your screen. I'm just going to explain it briefly and then move on from it. Um, that big adjustment of the $2.8 billion in loss reserves there in 2000. But other than that, that was, that was the large uh, amount of fraud that was later uncovered. Um, now I'm going to turn it back to Logan to, to finish out the presentations on lessons learned and a couple questions for you guys. All right. So for lessons learned, we had about three, if I remember right. Um, the first one was how important communication is between the board of directors and the external auditors. Communication is actually pretty key in all businesses. So just always be paying attention to that. Uh, another thing is how important integrated audits are to detect internal control risk. That's really going to mainly focus on like the CEO, like with Greenberg pretty much doing this all by himself, better audit would have helped us. And the next one is how important it is to detect, to prevent and detect collusion. So with Greenberg and Ferguson kind of coming together to commit this fraud, uh, people have to pay more attention to it. And next is our question. Uh, Elliot Spitzer, the New York Attorney General stated, the irony of this case is that AIG was a well-run and profitable company that didn't need to cheat. This being said, why do you think AIG engaged in these fraudulent activities despite being a successful and profitable business? I think if I remember right, that would be our, our end of our presentation. I want to thank everybody for listening and ha make sure you guys have a great summer. I'm pretty sure everyone graduates, so congratulations to all you guys as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.